for the Wednesday uh, live stream. Amelia, this is the dog, the Pope's intro. Not here last week, we had a great guest uh, on the show. Unfortunately, Joe the intern is no longer here. He's back at school. I tried to get him to stay. He couldn't be here. Rather than spend some money on your last name, he stayed with us. He wouldn't do it. He said he couldn't. Um, yes, I can increase my mic on the show. How's that? Is that a little bit better, Terry? We're doing a test test. Pulling that mic up. All right, perfect. Uh, so, guys, uh, good morning. Uh, typical five minutes late. Of course, we had to restart the whole computer uh, before the thing for Google Chrome for some ridiculous reason. Just kind of standard operating procedures. So, uh, you know, happy uh, end of summer. For me, I say good riddance. Uh, kind of tired of these ranges. Um, which is it's weird when you kind of filter through all the news that's being uh, sent at us from, from Trump, Trump's Twitter account, from President Xi, from the G7, uh, from data. I mean, it's just been, oh, we feel like something wants to happen. Um, I, don't, I can't remember a time that I've watched the market so intently, uh, pretty much since I think the last busy summer was 2002 when WorldCom and Enron came out and the markets were just going crazy. I was as engaged in the markets all summer uh, as I was then, but we just didn't have the price movement today, uh, this summer. So that's fine. You know, we've got some pretty good moves in fixed income in uh, commodities. I would say not so much in equities that hasn't come through yet. So we'll talk about that. We have a great guest on, John Netto, longtime friend, uh, great global macro trader. Uh, so we'll bring him in, and uh, yeah, we're, we're we're good here. So let's. Uh, Let's do this to start. How's everyone doing, by the way? Hey, guys. Good morning. Michael, Algo, Javier, audio. Audio better? Joe's desk looks so empty. No kidding. Yeah, how's the audio? Is it better? You want me to? I can turn it up if you want. Uh, I was actually on my, I was actually on my uh, audio mix. Let's see. I can do that. Testing now. I was on my with my consultant last night. We were playing with the audio. Let's try to it didn't work. Let me just pump this up one sec. Yeah, I see it now. Uh, audio settings. We are going to pump. Oh yeah, it's down to thirty-two percent. Test, 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 guys. Watch out in your speakers. I'm increasing the volume. Test, test. Testing one. Test, test, test. Test, test. There we go. Is that better? More. Perfect. Okay, good. Um, all right, guys, so let's do this here. Let's do this. Let's do this. Um, let me just kind of take you through uh, the markets here uh, quickly. First, let's bring in the team. Alex, uh, there you go, buddy. Hey, buddy. Alex, Terry, good morning, guys. How you doing? Good hey, morning. Traders, how's everybody today? All good. Uh, hello. We've got my trusty team, Alex and Terry, as always here. Say hello. Um, yeah, how you guys doing? What's shaking here today? Not a whole lot on this end. We got school going on, so school back in session. Oh, that's right. You guys go back early. You guys yeah, back early. yeah. All right. All right. Alex is good. FX is quiet. Crypto, well, FX is moving. We'll talk about that in a second here. Um, all right. Let's bring those uh, guys. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Yeah, crypto is, is uh, sideways for the last few days. So okay. uh, we are still watching the grass grow. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. It's a little more interesting than when that was happening. We <laughs> that was a long session last year when we were literally were watching the grass grow because there was nothing to do. But, nothing. Oh, uh, it's a little more exciting now. Things are moving now. Things are moving. So, all right, perfect. We'll bring you guys back in here in one sec. Uh, let me just take kind of take you through what we're seeing here in the markets and from an from a from a uh, equity index point of view. You know, I, I I think I may have come to a realization yesterday. Um, as I kind of hide the wave counts here quickly, guys, um, this is August that I've talked about. You know, it, despite all the headlines that have been pelting us, massive move lower in rates, big move up in gold, silver, 
Um, you, you know, we're seeing commodities sell off, a lot of deflationary forces pushing, and it's just not manifesting in equity. So you have a tale of basically the market's testing the lower end of the 200-day moving average. Um, the test of the 200-day here, this is the exponential, whether you should use simple or this is actually the SMA. Uh, you, you know, you tell me what the proper one is. I don't know. I'm certainly not the moving average expert. But the whole market's been defined right now as testing of the 200-day moving average. And the S&P right now has just been in this blob of nothingness in August. Now, when you put that through the filter of, of Elliott, you would say, well, it certainly doesn't look impulsive. And when I say impulsive, that means just simply a five-wave move with good separation between four and two. That looks like not impulse. That looks corrective to me. And if that means this is corrective, that potentially means that the prior move was, in fact, motive, which means part of the hard degree trend. So, I, you know, but, but we're just not seeing the downside follow through as much as the market wants to sell off. I mean, we have short positions. I'll show you the short positions. We're short emerging markets. I talked about that on Fast Money last week. I'm short some Microsoft. I took some SBX puts home overnight just, for, just to see if we can catch a little flyer. You know, uh, we have some, some bond positions, we have some gold positions. We established some uh, inverse ETFs. We began to hedge our longer term portfolio a little bit. I'll show you that. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on here. And I'm wondering as much as I think and want the market to go down, it's just not. What if this big thing is a big old nasty triangle? And if that's the case, um, you know, the, the invalidation point for this triangle would just simply be a break of 28, 22. Um, the chances, I think, are low. But, and this is something we discuss with our members all the time. The chances of identifying the end of a, of a consolidation that's been in place since April are, is low. But what you pick up in terms of, um, what, you, what you lose in terms of predictability, you pick up in terms of reward to risk. So if we're at 2870, we're going to, Futures are down here right now. Let's just check the futures. Down 0.14, so whatever. Um, you know, we have 50 points of risk. And if this is right, you know, you're looking at 3,100, 3,200 min. I, no, not min. 31 to 32 is a comfortable upside target. So that's, that's a massive return to risk, uh, return to reward uh, ratio. So, you know, that's something we, we are considering. Um, we are still very much considering the bear side. Um, if, if we do start to break through 28, 22, uh, you're looking at a pretty significant drop. And again, all the bad news that's been thrown at the market, I have a hard time saying that that is going to be the case, but I can't wait to be proven wrong. Um, bonds are on the move on the upside. I'll show you a quick TLT position that we're working here. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the two guests that I had on last week, you know, last week and this week are just wonderful in the FX and the macro space. And this is such a macro market. And it's not surprising, and I, I don't want to take any thunder from, from Neto, um, but it's not surprising to see equity lags. Equities are typically the fourth asset class to react to moves in fixed income, commodities, and currencies. And commodities and in, in fixed income are moving, currencies are kind of moving, and equities are not moving. So it could be just kind of a, a, of a lagging effect there. Um, in terms of bonds, huge move up. I just locked in my 30-year refi. I got 337 from TD Bank, like go TD, like super ridiculously low. Like don't pay off your loan. I mean, who wouldn't want three and a, three and a third percent money? Um, so, you know, that being said, and part of the reason I locked in the refi is here's your 30 year bond. And I think it's a pretty simple wave count. Uh, if you're looking at a wave one up here, push back in two, you take a multiple of net percent distance traveled in one, project it up in three. Your 1618, your textbook upside, 200% is your, is your little extended. So I'm looking for a little bit of a fourth wave pullback here. So that's bonds. Uh, here's TLT. And, you know, TLT, same kind of situation. This is your 20 plus year uh, U.S. Treasury ETF. We're certainly at a point where TLT is extended. Uh, the way TLT measures, we're actually beyond the 200% into the 2618. So really overcooked. So the trade that we just put on, and I'll show you exactly what we're doing here, and I love putting these kind of trades on um, around a potential sideways consolidation. It could be triangle, could be a flat, could be a complex, who knows? Uh, but this is certainly the area where a wave four could begin. Centered around the 145 strike, um, 
here is the tray that we're in. Where's my TLT macro hedge? No, that's the other one. Let me go over here to Roth trade to TLT. Okay, so let me go like this. So here's the actual trade that we have on. I'll put it in the analyze tab. Just a traditional butterfly, guys. We're short the 145 puts eight times. I'm long four of the 140s and four of the 150s. Just trying to capture this range in here. This is the expected wave four zone. I've got max $700 risk, no problem. Max potential re rewards about 1,200. So just kind of a little trade on the on the upside. Um, but you know, in our longer term portfolio, you know, we have a pretty good allocation towards bonds, towards gold. I do have some inverse in here, inverse ETF, SDS. So we are hedging uh, this little $100,000 account that I put out there to kind of build track record towards money management. We only have 78%, which now it's less than that because the account has grown. Only you know, roughly 75% of the money allocated long equities. We have 12%, actually less than that, allocated towards risk off sort of a hedge. And I still have a decent amount of cash on hand. Happy to say we are outperforming the S&P since portfolio inception. So, you know, that's what we're, we're kind of looking at here. Um, let me just check the comments, questions, insults. Um, everybody good? Everybody good? Alex and Terry, yeah, everyone loves Alex and Terry. I love those guys too. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of it. Um, let me just give you, you know, I'll, I'll save the stocks um, that I'm looking at, some of, the, some of the stocks that I'm looking at in the list here uh, for the end of the, um, of the, after I interview uh, Mr. Neto here, and uh, we'll show you some setups that we're looking at going forward. We'll probably take you into the clo into the open here and see what's see what's happening. So, uh, all right. Without further ado, let's bring in my very very good friend, uh, colleague. Let me just bring the right screen over here. Uh, let's go like this. Introducing. The man who has got more energy and drive and passion than pretty much all of you combined. A guy who loves trading, loves investing, loves life. Good friend, John Netto. How are you doing today? Doing better. I'm on a little bit of crude, but not enough. You know the saying, um, never enough on the way up and too much on the way down. Um, oh, did you know, did I mention he the... trades like a lot? Yeah. As in like right now, take a look at crude right now. We're popping above 56 here. Um, and you actually, you and I were time. trading back and forth and he was long a bunch of crude and he's like, it's going 50, 55 bid. And where are we right now? I'm sure we're above 50. We're 56. 56 oh, why not? Nice trade, dude. Why not? Nice yeah. trade. So, um, I mean, I think we melt up here to 56.50 um, and, and obviously one of the stipulations and provisions. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. Before we jump in, what? I'm running the interview here, Neto. Sorry. Well, I'm trading, How baby. We're firing live rounds, Adi. Live doing, rounds buddy? this one, baby. Listen. No demo accounts on, on, on Elliott Wade Weekly, okay? Listen, Neto was kind enough. First of all, I, I met Neto back in 2002 when I was prop trading uh, with my buddy Dave Floyd. And he was friends with Neto. Neto he introduced me to Neto. Neto was trading live capital like... 17 years ago through the web had a sniper cam and he would show his live account. Um, I was like 22 years old at the time and he's, he's swinging two, three, four thousand dollars you know, P&L swings. And I'm like, this guy's out of his mind. I mean, that was all the money in the world to me back then. Um, so that's the beginning of the relationship and we've always stayed in contact. Neto's a real deal trader, uh, swing size all the time. He's got an audited track record in terms of trading, super active, aggressive guy. Brought me in to um, contribute to this monstrosity behemoth of a book. Ready? The Global Macro Edge, baby. Uh, he, oh. he brought me in. I mean, just amazing guys. Guys, um, I mean, a bunch of institutional experience uh, in this book. If you haven't, I'll show you how to get a hold of a copy of this. But... He was kind enough to let me write an Ellie Wave chapter in this, buddy. Thanks for bringing me along. A ton of good information in this. Kind of talk about the concept of the book here quickly, um, where you're at in terms of like you and I are joking, your fifth or sixth chapter of your career. You know, let's let's start there. Sure. So 
addressing the issue with the book here, crews have a nice little pullback following the, the 9 a.m. Um, open. And it's it's funny because crude's in a little tracking of the S&P right now. S&P just rallied and bounced at VWAP. And, and the crude, crude has done a much better job than the S&P has in terms of shaking off the risk. So that's encouraging for crude longs and probably encouraging for S&P shorts. To answer your question directly, um, you know, the global macro edge really is about how to properly, at least how I, um, using the great network that I have, which includes one, one Todd Gordon, um, contextualize price action and how I take all these individuals, because there really is a sentiment that if you look throughout nature, that the best hunters work in packs, okay? Even in the ocean, all right? Most people think that the, 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 the shark is the, is, the, is the apex predator, but in fact, it's the killer whales. And killer whales are incredibly communicative um, creatures. And so whether it's our collaboration, Todd Gordon, or whether it's any of the other contributing authors, the global macro edge was an encapsulation of that, of that collaboration, but really built upon a theme of how do we maximize return per unit of risk? Looking at every trade, every investment, every portfolio, every market circumstance from the perspective of how much am I risking, how much do I make, and then how do I quantify and control the risk around that? And so when it comes to crude this morning, you know, I think we're going to 56.50, we're at 56.02 right now. Mm -hmm. I'm on a small amount. Um, compared to yesterday, we caught a very nice move yesterday, blew out of a bunch of it, have right. some hanging out there and been maneuvering that. So, yeah. Hold, hold on. Do you want to share screens? Do you want to hop on there? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Well, let me just Okay, so I just here. pop go to up and I made you a presenter. Good, something should good, pop good us. Yeah. You know how to okay. roll with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, here we go. Uh, you see my charts? Over. And there we go. Boom. Okay, you're live. Okay, cool. So as you can see from this, you, you, you can see, you see, see a crude chart right now. I just want to make sure you have the right one. I do. Yep. Yep. I'm just resizing okay, our, cool. our, our fat so, heads here. CQG does a good job of, um, of, of showing where your orders are. And yesterday when we were talking, I had some options sitting right around um, this 5440 spot, 5450 spot, took some heat on them. And right about here, we started to go the other way. I rolled out of the options, bought the underlying. You can see I got long hair and just started where all these yellows are, there's the buys yep. and just ultimately bought up a bunch of it right up at this um, 55, 35 spot. Um, we rallied overnight and then I started working the bids again and now I'm riding for another move up. And I think ultimately so, this thing. So wait a minute, ahead, wait a minute. So, so first thing that I noticed in those entries, you're not buying pullbacks. That's a that's a momentum trade. I, I, I see this as a 60 minute chart, but you saw the pullback to 53.75, yeah. goes 54 half bid, and then you start buying into the strength, right? And you just did the same well, trade again. Well, a little again. bit here is, is look at this trend line break that we had on crude here, okay? okay. So yeah. this buy is more reflective of this. So okay. this is an hourly, but if we, if we break it down to a smaller chart, I am looking for pullbacks within that. Yep. But it's more about there's been a reversal here. And so you can't get as finicky when it comes to buying pullbacks, when we've had a big trend line break, there's a reprice in the market that's taking place. So you can see here, I'm looking, these greens are where I'm trying to buy right now, okay? okay. And, and these buys are where I'm hoping it pulls back to, but that's just not gonna happen, you know? So, so, so the bottom line me, is I told you like- Those yeah. little yellow, about 50, 55 and three quarters, those are your re-entries right there? Yep. Right, the, the, those, are, those are entries where like, I'm, I'm nibbling, Todd, I'm nibbling. Yep. I, my, my bigger position is down here. But I got a nibble right now because I think this thing's gonna freaking melt like it's doing as we're talking. Okay, okay. it's got gonna it. melt up to fifty six fifty. So I gotta have something on. You know what I mean? Knowing that I can reload with size down below to to, to follow my more traditional pullback system. But right now, if we've broken out it in a reprice, you've got to have some exposure. So as you're managing this crude trade, what else are you looking at? Do you take the global macro edge and look at hopefully dollar breaking down? If commodities are going up, I would say we want to see rates going up, bonds going down, and sort of a reflationary play. I mean, are you looking at cross cross current, cross market analysis? Yes, but but I look at it in two contexts. One is is cross market price action principal or incidental to the underlying crude price action? I believe that the the, the global macro edge, which is in essence incorporating the macro narrative on top of um, robust price trading systems, yep. um, that th the message behind crude right now is, in, is, is principal to the crude market and the macro markets are incidental to crude price action. 
which is why we're actually seeing the S&P struggle for the last two days and crude oblivious to the struggles of the S&P. Yeah. So I think that it's more of a supply issue. And, and, and in those circumstances, you want to be less concerned with what the S&P is doing and more concerned with the independent price action on the crude market. Right. I mean, I mean, again, it's like it's such a weird August market. I'm looking at 30 year bonds up half a percent and crude up like that. That shouldn't really be happening. Like, but we are in a lot. Despite everything that is I open the webinar, despite with everything we think that's happening in equities, I think VIX basically for the news cycle that we're being hit at is like 50 percent underpriced. Right. And my point is when VIX is low, correlations are low, especially across the four main asset classes. Right. So. So right. to your point, like, OK, I, they're, they're almost all kind of coincident or they're not kind of driving each other. I just, feel some, just a little red out of that. I just took some off there, Toddy. Took some okay. off at 56.22. Just the Evan, I can feel a little bit of a little bit of something. I'm still long some, but you can see the, uh, you know, the great work that you let you. Let me, let me put even a smaller time frame here. I'll put this on a three minute chart. Okay. OK, so this is where I bought the most recent thing. And now this is where the red is. Where I just took some off there. It kind of feels like they can give us a pull, like a 56 where I'll, where I'll reload. So even though I'm not in my full position, I can still do some maneuvering with what I have on there. But I'm still long a base because 5650 is my target. But I kind of feel some ebb and flow developing. Sorry, we we'll just make it no. Happen. I love yeah. it. I love it. How does the can the can the average? And I'll consider myself average because I'm not hooked up on the on the platforms. I'm just using the retail thinkorswim platform. Can the average retail guy, which again myself included. Can we trade on your time frame? Do we are we behind, you know, in terms of execution, or can we play in your sandbox? No, you can play in my sandbox. I think, listen, the way the global macro edge was written, every person, even non-traders, entrepreneurs, all of us must go through a unit of risk assessment of every investment we make, every decision we make in life of what am I risking? And then what was the risk adjusted return on that? So if I take you, Todd, let's say you open a hundred thousand dollar account, and let's think about what the return per unit of risk is, and let's think about what the netto number is in that capacity. So I wanna measure on an apples to apples basis how your $100,000 account compares against a $2 million account. Sure. Well, in that $100,000 account, you manage risk very diligently. In fact, I would argue that of that 100K, if the amount falls below, let's say 75,000, you're gonna significantly curtail or even potentially stop trading in there. I'm, I'm just oh, making something up with an example. Okay. okay? So, yeah. Yep. So, so, so if I'm going to compare your hundred thousand dollar account, I need to compare it with its risk budget of two hundred of, of twenty five thousand on on an apples to apples basis with someone that runs two million, and maybe they have no risk budget. Maybe they can lose it all. Okay. So the end of the year, if your hundred k maybe takes a five k drawdown, it falls to ninety five, and then it ends up at one twenty. Well, think about that. You were only risking twenty five. Okay. You had a five k drawdown and made twenty five. Right. That's a really right. good netto number. And all of a sudden, I can measure the performance of Google, the performance of oil, the performance of Todd Gordon against each other on an apples to apples basis in a three dimensional way, because Absolutely. I knew what your risk what budget was beforehand. Absolutely. No, that's a That's a great point. And, you know, every time a, a member comes into our company trading analysis, I, I make them decide what's their tier. And just simply, it's not as complex as your calculation, but, you know, tier four is your average everyday trade. What percent of your account, I don't care if it's a $10,000 account you're looking to quintuple in the next six months, or if it's a $10 million account you're looking to manage and just simply outperform the S&P, what's your average everyday tier four, what's your tier three, tier two, and tier one? Tier one is literally the stars are aligning. And for me, I might risk 5% of my capital in a tier one, which I haven't had in two years, right? So it's all about deciding. Nobody likes to talk about the downside of trading and the risk, but you do this game long enough. I mean, I've only been trading for 20 years, 19 years. And trust me, the risk is the first thing that you think about. When you're a newer trader, you're always thinking how much you can make. That's, that's a very typical new path into trading. But you do this game, this godforsaken game that we love so much long enough, and your mentality will start to shift. And everything that Neto and I are talking about is, is on the downside. Um, and the upside kind of takes so care now of So I put itself. the S&P side by side here to, to illustrate a point that you were getting to, Todd, that, that, or the point that you were talking about that I was making, that, that there's very little correlation today. Here's a three-minute chart of crude. Here's a three-minute chart of the S&P. Oh, interesting. So um, S&Ps went bit at five. Actually, you know what? There's a little, there's a little movement together. Crude kind of double. A little bit. Uh, uh, not, not, not inconsequential and not totally yeah. uncorrelated. Right. This is crude hanging out at highs. 
this is the S and P selling off to overnight lows or, or, or near the lows of the previous hour here. So this is that's gonna be not that far above. Look at crude on the overnight chart, okay? Like this yeah. is very different spectrums right now, okay? Like this is a market that is trading totally on its own metrics, or or, or, or enough on its own metrics that it's that it's noteworthy. Whereas the S and P is kind of a little more languishing, um, caught with a, with a lot taking place. So to me. I think the Iranian premium is coming back in. There's a greater risk from mm. coming back in crude that, that's happening. And when you asked earlier, how nutty is it that both treasuries and crude can be rallying? Well, under the right geopolitical circumstances, it's quite probable, actually. What if we have a blow up in the Persian Gulf or we're yeah. repricing Persian Gulf mm. risk? That's very conducive so, to bonds rallying mm. and, and, and crude rallying as well. Do you, do you think that's the latest mm. leg up in gold? Or, or is gold reflective of a, a much return to dovishness from our fed is it is it just a just dropping yes. rates like is this a deflationary rally in gold which you know what how much how much you attribute this gold move to that versus geopolitical tensions it's, it's yield compression taking place everywhere i mean this this um the, memorize this term okay tina as in like a girl i used to date there is no alternative t-i-n-a there is no alternative and right now gold which yields zero yep. is more appealing than seventeen trillion dollars of assets that that, that, that yield friggin' negative yields. So Incl by virtue of the including yield Bitcoin. dynamic, including Bitcoin. including Bitcoin, yeah, yeah, and so yeah. and so gold all of a sudden as a zero yielding currency, that that's that's a that's a viable option, and so I think to me that that's what accounts for this next. Sort of this this leg up in gold is likely going to continue, and likely gold's going to go test its all time highs above Wait, two thousand. Is this and and I, I I love our GLD position. I mean, is this just another form of a? You remember the temper the taper tantrum the, the markets had oh, about I do. five years. June twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. June twenty thirteen. Oh, I traded that like, like, like a beast. Yeah, Dude, no, that, that was, was great. Six, May so twenty thirteen. Is this another form of taper tantrum where the U.S. tried to raise rates uh, relative to the rest of the world? I mean, I don't think we had the context in 2013 of us against the rest of the world, but now we're like, okay, wow, we're trying to raise rates. There's a 200 basis point spread from us and the, the rest of the, uh, you know, the developed nations. Like, and we're like, nope, nope, we're not having it. And either Trump did it or Powell did it on his, his own fruition. Like, is this just another form that we are forever going to have ZERP? And we're, uh, you know, does, do equities rally on that? What, 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 what is, how do stocks react to that if that is in fact the case? Okay, there's about seven questions there. I'll, I'll try to answer all of them. <laughs> um, so, in, in the mind, case of the temper tantrum, your mind can handle it. I'm not worried. No, for sure. And if I and if I forget something, you'll remind me. Um, I just peeled another another crude off there. You can see that at 56.32. Yeah. Peeled another one off um, nice. with the little red arrow there. Um, I mean, this is a nice little morning move for us, and 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 we're we're, we're appreciative of that. Um, bottom line, to, to your point. I think the Fed was actually on pace to keep on hiking in a very gradual manner as they illustrated what, what took place was the trade war and broad global, you know, broad global weakening that was taking place um, incidental to or, or, or um, aside from the trade war that was happening. And, you know, markets hate ambiguity. And so what we've had here is an injection, uh, uh, an injection of, of a lot of ambiguity. So, you know, Trump, I mean, say what you will about him, but the guy thrives off of the attention that comes from manipulating, manipulating, I gotta watch that word. It comes from tweeting things that, that move the market. There is a rush from that sort of power and it's not going to end anytime soon. I think the only thing that you can feel guaranteed about is that there will be more tweets that surprise more people um, in the coming weeks and, and months. Now to your question about central banks, I think what this is actually showing is that central banks are losing their influence on the market. In other words, it's like pushing a rope. And yep. so they're becoming okay. less and less influential. Yep. And as a result of that, that's actually another cause of why gold is rallying because people, you know, animals in nature, when it comes to survivability, they don't like to be, they don't like to die. They don't like to be irrelevant. And so the last gasp, okay, when all of a sudden you see that, that, that you're losing, you know, proportionally with each stimulus measure that it's having less and less of an impact is to double down. I mean. If you're a drug addict, what do you do when that high, when just one gram of Coke is enough for you, all right? You either get more hookers or you get more Coke, all right? Most people Neto, get both. This is a family show. It's 9.20 in the morning. We can't be talking about hookers and cocaine, all right?
Not even from Las Vegas? Okay, that's good. So the oh, bottom the line way, is... Nutto is in Vegas, yeah, yeah. Because I live here. And just, just, um, just as a disclaimer, this is calm for Neto. I'm telling you, and it's you know this is the, so. Anyways, but let, let me push. Well, and I back. am, and I'm multi. I'm trading full time here. What I know you are. I know. But let me push yeah. back on one so, thing where you say this is this is a, the, the weakness is a result of overseas uh, weakness. This has been going on in something that we've been talking about for years. I mean, can you see my screen now? You should be able to see. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's the S&P over emerging markets. 51, 49% of it is Asia. Most of that is China, some South Korea. Like that divergence has been going on for 15 years, right? I mean, what, all of a sudden we're now talking about this. You know what I'm saying? Like, what, I just, I just don't buy it. I feel like Trump. I feel like Trump is trying to maneuver right to the point, cause enough damage before he hits the campaign trail, causes the Fed to cut rates, strike a deal with China. Then the market rallies right up to the point where he's on the campaign trail, and then that reassures his, his election. Am I oversimplifying this? No, because he's a pretty simple guy. And, and I think that we tend to make, I mean, I, I'm guilty of this, uh, making things much more complex than they need to be. Right. But we are, I mean, and why wouldn't you? Given our behaviors, given our recency bias, given the way that we vote, you know, we don't remember things from a year ago or, or 18 oh. months ago when it comes to voting. We just especially don't. In the, like, it's especially just, in the information age. I mean, there's so much being thrown at us. Like, how can we retain everything? So I, ideally, why would, you, why would you come out with a trade agreement with China sometime in 2019 so that it can just be expected? So, so that it can be, well, of course you have a trade agreement. The way, the way revisionist historians work, do that like in Q, do that sometime around the New Hampshire caucus, okay, there New Hampshire go. primaries. There you okay, go. And, um, and and then you, you have it that way. And don't think that China, listen, China doesn't want to like take the risk that he gets reelected. Yes, we'll wait till the next U.S. election. Yes, yes. But when you have a deal on the table and it's something that you can go for and you can give that certainty, despite all the posturing, you know, going to law school. So I go to Neto, law school. I, at I also I, I forgot to mention Neto is in Pepperdine Law School right now while trading full time and being father to Holy a beautiful God. baby girl. Uh, he's got a lot going on. I just brought my team, Alex and Terry, in to to help me with this uh, with this discussion. What's up, guys? Can you hear us? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so please continue, Neto. Man, I thought you had a lot of energy, Todd. Holy oh, crap! Oh, I told you, John. John, <laughs> how many of them five-hour energy drinks you drink a day? It's all natural, Terry. <laughs> I swear, I swear it's all natural. Nothing. 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 No. Wow. No alcohol but, either. But your to your yeah. point, Neto, like I mean, it's it's not even it's not even now to to New Hampshire. It's like the day before he he sent out a tweet. Who's a bigger enemy of the state, either President Xi or Powell? I mean, good God, you can't you can't say that. I mean, this is the this is the official United States government. And then the next day he comes out in France. He's saying, well, you know, President Xi is a great friend of mine. He's a very intelligent leader. The day before he called the enemy of the state, and then. When they questioned him in France, he came back and said, well, guys, that's the way I negotiate. This is part of the tactics. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, OK. I don't know if he's that calculated or if he's just that reactionary. Uh, what do you think? Um, both. I mean, I think he's, he's, he showed some tremendous impulse that would be better served not. I mean, listen, I think what, if you want to just take an objective look at Trump and, and, and just from a political perspective, and, and this is what and I tell you, going to law school, you really understand the plumbing and the Constitution of the United States and sort of all the legal theory behind mm -hmm. how our system was created and established. So yeah. that's important. So yeah. I'm saying that under that premise or context that what Trump represents or represented on a good day is an outsider who can bring business savvy to what is perceived as a largely inefficient government structure that has been haphazard with a lot of our tax dollars and could stand to become much more efficient um, and, and get back to sort of what the Jeffersonian small government um, federalist dreamed of, or not federalist, federalist were the other way, dreamed of when they first created this country, you know, 220 years ago, all right? And that appeal of bringing that outsider perspective um, was a legitimate fervor. And despite the personality, it's one of those, it's the right message, but the wrong messenger. You know, and so now we have to handicap what we have in front of us. Yeah, but the, the message but, of 
But the American, the American public could only be attention. The American public's attention could only be captured by somebody who's as, as sensationalistic as he is. I mean, compare him to like a Mitt Romney. Like, okay, he had a couple campaign, uh, you know, failures. You know, he's just not. He's not a polarizing figure. You need somebody who's sensationalistic. You need a reality TV star to get people's attention. Yeah, love him, love him or hate him. I think you stirred the pot, and I think this is actually what the what we needed because, you know, my personal opinion, Republicans or Democrats, neither one I was happy with in the last uh, in the last several sure. terms yep. because they're just not getting anything done. Yep. Uh, you know, despite all this, the the bad rhetoric around Trump and 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 the, the, his tweets and his, he's not part of that culture. And I think that's why everybody hates him. He's not part of that machine. And he brings what really I think the country needed. They needed this fresh new perspective to wake everybody up and get the government uh, running again. So yeah. I don't somebody, know. I think from somebody, now on, you're going to start to see who, you know, some, some new candidates bringing some new, new insights, uh, you know, in the future, whether he wins or not, the next election is going to be a very important one for the market as well as the economy and uh, the rest absolutely. of the country so absolutely um hey john um, go ahead Alex. yes yeah uh we john uh, alex I'm, I'm is, our, a... is head of our fx analysis he was an institutional fx trader uh in belgrade Great. i've been out there twice and uh, good experience super good guy and is amazing at picking uh levels reversals and, and elliott and good fundamental background as well. Yeah, John, I'm I'm kind of a, 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 I know about you for several years as well. Nice to meet you this way for for uh, for a quick chat. And uh, I, I'm curious. Uh, we also I'm leading the crypto market here uh, with trading analysis as well, and we heavily trade crypto market in the last year. And uh, what is your opinion about uh, all of this uh, which surrounds the crypto, crypto market? How do, you, how do you perceive it from the global macro perspective, if you have any opinion on it? Yeah, no, I do. Um, I, think, I think it's a very credible asset class. I think um, it, it represents, it represents, it's part of this, this risk parity trade, and I'm gonna go like off a little bit here, but that's what's great about live ad lib internet. Um, when you look at this decade, categorically, the single most successful trade, and I measured that based on not only the, ret the risk adjusted returns, but also the scale from which you could have put it on, okay? The most successful trade was risk parity, meaning your 55% long equities, your 40% long bonds, your 5% long gold, and your 5% long alternative, sort of your credit component. And let's just put crypto in that credit component, okay? But on a risk-adjusted basis and the size which you can put that on, just look at Bridgewater to get a sense of that. And so what does that represent? Going back to 2017, that represents a world where we are decentralizing how we spend money, okay? And to me, crypto is as much about um, efficiently using idle resources as is and um, as is uber when you think about when you drive to the airport alex all right and, and and what the original concept of like uber was the whole ride sharing concept is i'm driving to the airport i have three empty seats in my car this this app is going to allow me to utilize or better utilize my idle resources what are my idle resources those three empty seats in my car to the airport airbnb it's about better utilizing the idle room in your house um, so that so that you can the person can stay there for a better price and you can get something from that. So to me, cryptocurrencies are an extension of this shared economy and how we evaluate every aspect of our life from how we spend our money to how we utilize um, the land we live in to how we utilize our transportation. And and more broadly, I think it's very bullish. And I think that you know both cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology they're different things. Um, yeah, very yeah, sure. future. Yeah, it's more that narrative. Guys, great. Yeah, so it's it's a question ahead, of, of basically, yeah, it's a question of efficiency from the one point of view, yeah. Correct, completely. That's okay. great. Uh, one, one quick question more, uh, since I'm, I'm sure. holding the thesis that in, in one moment, uh, Trump will, will actually, or the United States will have to devalue the US dollar from several perspectives. I cannot go 
quickly into that. Uh, what is your right. opinion about the future of the of the dollar? Um, ironically, a devaluation of the U.S. dollar may be good for the U.S. dollar. And, and follow me on this, okay? And this is how convoluted you have to look at this stuff. All right, we're filled. Price target filled on crude. There you go. Nice. We got it to the. the open. Uh, Whoa. Yeah. Yep. And so, so that's um, we got that fifty six fifty spot we were talking about there, Todd. Or fifty six forty eight. We had our targets there. We blew out. To, to, to your point, Alex, I want you to think real quick about about what it means, what state the world would be in that if we go and attempt to devalue, just the same way in, in 2011, when we we're going to default on our 30 years, what happened to interest rates on 30 year loans when the threat of us um, not coming to a budget agreement happened? The 30 year yield actually went down because the risk of that represented globally sent bond yields everywhere lower. All right. So the idea that the dollar okay would consider defaulting may actually stimulate m people to go to the safe haven currency which would be the dollar it's kind of messed up i mean like like, like or or in the u.s treasury it's like it was, whoa, it, it was just like the way credit treasury. crisis it's just like the real estate bubble originated here spread to the rest of the world and where'd money come right back into the short-term treasuries which you have to buy dollars first so the dollar was the biggest beneficiary of the credit crisis yeah, so, uh, but so, I mean, now, from, I, from, I, from, I, mean I haven't fully, I'm sorry, Alex, I haven't fully thought that out, but I just think it's important that, you know, understand like where, I mean, to me, the yen is an obvious beneficiary of that. And I think the yen has some really compelling aspects to yeah. it in terms of, you know, the idea that we're in a global debasement or, you know, that, that it got that far should be very beneficial to gold and very beneficial to the yen. But I don't know how. I don't know how bad the dollar would be impacted by that. Let's get a pullback here in crude. Though. I want to reload on this bad boy. I love it. I love it. Uh, can, Mr. Can you Nettle, see my charts gonna... there? My charts are gone now, right? Uh, no, we can pull, pull it back up here. I think I've managed to muddle the screen here pretty good. Uh, I have. I don't know why I'm all switched up here. I, I'm doing something with the software here. I missed Joe the intern, but go ahead. There's, there, we're overlaid on top of each other, but but let it let it fly. So here we are taking tactical exits here, here and here. All right, and now you know even 56.15 is a spot that we can maneuver. But these were you know from our entry in here earlier, just had some nice you know that's just what it is, and that's the price target we talked about. That's what we got. So now we're going to wait to wait to reload. So I don't think that this trend is done, but I do think short term that was a nice you know that was a nice um nice short term top. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, listen, John, it was great having you on. I appreciate yes. you spending some time. Nice trade on crude. Uh, great discussion. And here we go. S&P selling off right now. Uh, futures coming off. Crude Alex and Terry, a pleasure to, to finally meet you guys. Yeah, thanks. I, uh, their audio is off, but I'm, you know, again, awesome. Love the energy. Neto, you're the best. Uh, so good discussion. And um, would you come back again soon? Yeah, I'd love to. I love this stuff. This, as long as I can trade, I'll come back anytime. <laughs> <That'll>, <laughs> I, I did the same. I know. I love it. We, this is this is a show for people who trade, carry the position, talk the way it is. Uh, nobody better than than John. So, hey man, appreciate it. Have a good rest of the day. I'll talk to you soon. Peace, brother. Go get him. See you, bud. Okay. Um, so, guys, just watching. That, that was John Netto. Uh, just watching the kind of discussions going on while while Alex and and Netto were talking. And people like get back the charts. Get, Get back to Ellie Wave. Like, look, here's the deal. We're traders. And whatever the market requires us to follow, we will follow. My preferred context methodology is Elliott. Um, and I always filter everything, both the fundamentals, the news, uh, technical developments through the lens of Elliott. But when the markets change, you must adapt and pay attention to what's driving the markets. This is a very news-driven market. So lovingly, respectfully, don't come on here and tell me, go look at charts, do LA wave only. We're traders. Our first and foremost goal is to make money. The ability to make money hinges on your ability to process the news and react and say, basically, is this a point, uh, is this a news point where it will cause the pattern to fulfill? It will cause a reversal in the market. So again, a little annoyed at seeing those comments and I'm just, I keep it real. This is the way this show is gonna be. This is a trading show. Ellie Wave happens to be my preferred methodology, but don't come on and say, get back to charts and get away from politics. That's what's driving markets right now, okay? So just lovingly saying that, um, 
if you don't, and we're not making political statements right now at all. We're just saying this is what's driving the news. It's central bank policy and it's what's coming out of the White House. And again, I've made the point with my customers that it's, it's, a, it's an August market. We've got a week to go in August. The markets need something to focus on, perhaps. Perhaps they're overblowing what's coming out of the White House and the central bank. But here we go. We're on the lows. Okay. Uh, so let's just take a look quickly at the markets. Um, let me see if I can refresh this screen. Something is happening. Uh, Terry, let's put Terry in. I don't know why. Let's put Alex in. Alex, can you back away there just a little bit? Um, perfect. Position. Something is getting caught in there. That's okay. Desktop capture. What the? Now, let me, do, let me just take a sec, guys. We're going to look at a little market stuff. I just want to make sure something is up with this. Terry is off. Alex made a presenter. No, I don't want to present. Um, oh, I see what's happening. Okay. Alex. One more sec, guys. Okay, there we go. Uh, Terry is called. Bring that over. Oh, this thing's all there we are. Yeah, but it's 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 still bugging up here. No, can, let me just see if I can clean this up and get this correct. Neto is out. Come on, VMix, get it together. VMix. Yeah, I never met somebody with such energy and passion. Oh, I awesome. thought you, I thought you were pretty awesome. No, no. <laughs> this he, guy, he this guy makes you look like you're you're walking in the slow lane. Oh, I know. Oh, oh that's how Nettle wow. rolls. He's the best. He's 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 one of the most genuine guys. Will give you the shirt off of his back. Uh, let me just build this screen again. This will take me about thirty seconds. We're gonna do a uh, desktop capture, and then we're gonna look at. Uh, we're going to look at the markets here. So we're going to do like this. We're going to bring three cameras in. We're going to bring in, uh, we're going to bring in Terry and we're going to position him down. Uh, guys, this will be about a 30 second process and then we'll roll. Uh, again, I'm still getting better. I'm not great with VMix, but we're getting there. Uh, just like capsule, let's do three it's hard to be a one-man show be yeah director you know, got, and and uh entertainment at the same time so that's all right it's fun um you know, this is still definitely not a, a professional level show we got to bring someone in to replace joe the intern i got to hire somebody who's good with tech so that'll be coming uh and then alex position seven alex zoom Okay. Alex, can you sit up a little bit? Is that as high as you go? Nope. There you go. Okay. That's good. Is it there, you go. there, you're centered. There we go. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, boom. Close enough. Um, okay. So we have the S&Ps on the lows. Um, let's kind of take what's going on here. You know, let's, let's start with crude, uh, as we were just discussing uh, with John. You know, when I filter crude through the lens of Elliott, and I've made this point a bunch with our, with our customers, um, I don't see anything that's concerning the crude oil market. And John, it was interesting, when John and I first started talking, um, you know, we were talking about the breakdown of correlations. We we're talking about crude's relative strength to the S and P. And for me, you know, I love crude on the upside here. Um, if the broader market can stabilize, I can't get the correlation out of my mind. But you know, this this is not breaking down through the fifty level. Uh, we're coming up on a pretty good trend line break here. And you know, John, I don't know how his mind works. I've only known him for fifteen years. He loves the strength in crude. And he's talking about supply issues. Uh, there could be some draws coming up here. And if we push up through 57 and a half, I mean, there's, there's a bid coming into crude there. Uh, traditionally, crude going up should put a pressure into bonds because that's an inflation, reflationary play. We're just not seeing it, right? So, so bonds are up on the highs as yields are dropping. What are the S&Ps doing? S&Ps are down 
0.4% now, and the NASDAQ's down 0.7. So I put out a bullish count as an alternative, as a possibility yesterday. Let's figure out where I'm wrong. As I said, I'd love to see the market get cracked here. I would absolutely love it. I love trading vol. If we break through 28, 22, that's the level here, okay? Um, and actually, you could say that's the final level. 28, 25 is, is your red flag. This is your initial 28, 34, 28, 25. And if 28, 22 goes, we're going significantly lower. And I'm going to be short like a very aggressive person um, in the like S&P. Banshee. Banshee, thank you, Terry. <laughs> Can you believe Neto was talking about cocaine and hookers on my show? Oh my gosh. Oh well. Hey, you know. Usually, you know, it's funny. He did a live trading event for CQG and he's just he swears like a like a sailor. If, is that the right word? Swears like a truck driver, drinks like yeah. a sailor. Yeah. He doesn't drink, but yeah, he swears like, like a truck driver. Like and CQG people are like, oh my God, Neto, you can't be doing this. <laughs> um so anyways, um, so if, if we do break through those, those levels, um, you know, we're going to get short. And we are positioned for it, right? So, so there is a possibility that we are about to embark on wave three down here in the S&P. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's an issue. Uh, a hedge, and Alex and Terry, jump in here uh, as you please. Um, a hedge that we've had on, I've talked about on Fast Money last week. Uh, we've had this trade on for quite some time. I mentioned it when we were going back and forth with, with Neto is the emerging markets. Uh, it would really help if crude broke down, but we're definitely seeing kind of this global deflationary commodity sell off. Australia, Norway, New Zealand, Alex's corner in the FX market uh, showing a lot of weakness. So we do have that trade on as well. Uh, let me bring that guy over. Uh, right here. So we're up a little bit of money right here on these two. These two positions starting to starting to make some progress here. These are two option positions that we have. Um, emerging markets uh, still down in the trade on the EEM. We've got the 38, 35 put spread. Still 51 days to go uh, on the downside. And then we are short Microsoft up a little bit of money uh, there. Okay, so those are kind of our two downside hedges. Um, over here. You know, I did bring home some SPX, just a just a little six day little trade there uh, on the downside, and we are still carrying a lot of uh, long positions here um, in our in our overall portfolio. So down about 0.4 percent here, uh, which is roughly tracking the S and P, which is down 0.4, but the Nasdaq is down 0.7. Uh, again, Alex and Terry, if you want to hop in, please do at any time. Um, one stock that is moving ridiculously is Costco. The stock is just, it's part of a group that is just absolutely rich, ripping, which is staples, which is reflective of the, of the thirst for yield and a interest rate environment that's plummeting. Costco off the lows, if you, from a, from a good LUA point of view, uh, from the lows, I would say two things are interesting about COST. Um, one is the 100% FIB projection of wave one was just met at 274. If you're in a good wave three, you should be able to reach beyond 100%. Maybe 138, maybe 1618. Significantly higher levels. The second part that makes me bullish on this in wave three is wave three needs to break down into five smaller waves. We don't yet have that. We've got a one, we've got a two. <clears throat> and now we start doing some fit projections in wave three. 1618, 200% are now being tested. If we we're to start to back away from this, I will look to get out of my Costco. We could be in for a pretty good pullback here on COST. These are super long charts. So um, yeah. I'm Costco, definitely going to- Costco's breakout though, it's, you know, if you follow the traditional cup and a handle pivot points and all that and look for yeah. the higher volume, this breakout that happened yesterday or the day before in Costco was was on like double average volume. Huge volume. So th this guy is still running strong. It looks like it's in a second base for sure. Um, and uh, I think you got further to get further upside on this. So this is definitely one I follow investor business daily. This is yep. one that's right there on their leaderboard. And uh, uh, they're a good reference for uh, for finding good fundamental stocks. So, yeah, so the, the market and the S&P are going sideways to lower, but there's there's still 
there are still uh, uh, high performing stocks out there. They're fewer and far between. So it's, it's hard to find uh, the ones when the market's in a, or the, the uptrend is under pressure. So, um, so that's why we're just trying to say, to stay pretty cautious right now, lean yourselves out. If, uh, if the market's not in a confirmed uptrend, we tend to just stay on the sidelines um, and, and look for more sideways trades. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So as much as we love it, we have to watch this area into the 300. This is potential, uh, potential danger zone in Costco. Um, Roku is another one. Uh, this one is just, I mean, obviously this has just been a ripper, but here's what's interesting about Roku is from an elevated point of view. And again, it's hard to do Elliot from IPOs and new activ new issues because there's not much history. But if, in fact, we did have a good wave one and two, uh, wave three, which is orange three, which is up and off the screen, 100% relationship of one versus three is at 129, which was just broke, broken. 161%, uh, which is your textbook wave three, is at 346. Same concept. You don't have five smaller waves inside of orange three. You, you could even argue that we might be in the belly of the beast here in the third of a third in Roku. If this market were to stabilize, you can be sure we're going to be right after ROKU. Uh, Garmin's another one. Starbucks continues to act well. Uh, Lulu, these are all holdings in our positions. Walmart is another one. Uh, Home Depot is on the breakout. Here's one thing I'd want to caution you guys about. Amazon. This is a huge issue and not like a big stock mar market cap. It's a big issue for the market. This is not a five-wave move that you really are going to fall mm. in love with. This is ugly. And this is a that overlap. It's just massive overlap. Unless it's a leading diagonal of one, okay, which, okay, fine. If it's a leading diagonal, we should go back and retrace something that uh, would reflect or would be a 38 or 50% retracement. If by chance this is a five-wave move, you know, we're not even at the 38% retracement at 17, 18. 50% would be down here at 16, 31. If Amazon is in a healthy uptrend and this analysis is wrong, we should at least go to 17, 18 to 16, 30, okay? And possibly 15, 48 down into the zone. If this analysis is right, we could have a big, big drop coming. Yeah. One Amazon. positive thing I do see is support there at the 200 moving average. But uh, if that fails, and uh, uh, yeah, look out below. Look out below, 100%. Um, so that's that. Uh, okay, guys, we're going to leave it there. Let me just check questions. Sorry for yelling at you guys earlier, but kind of a noise when, noise when people come on and say, here's what I, here's what I want you to do. Uh, I'm going to do what it takes to make money for my people. Um, Yes, Todd, it would be helpful to new practitioners you could assign your probabilities to alternates and primary wave counts. Ah, God, that's tough. Um, yes, I'll have to think about that one. Probabilities to alternates and primaries. I mean, I can do it. It's, it's going to be a discretionary, you know, it's going to be a discretionary uh, way for me to express that. Um, so, yeah, let me think about that one, though. Um, uh, W-A-Q-A-R, have you considered that uh, we're in a complex D in the S&P? Yes, we discussed that. Uh, I'll hit that again for you quickly. Uh, yes, because that is a very distinct possibility right there based on that. Um, if this is some kind of wave two, we've got you know 2790 is the gateway to the downside uh, right there. That's the definitive bull bear divide, okay? Um, John was awesome. Please have him on regularly. Yeah, I absolutely will, Jameson, for sure. He's, he's, he's great. Um, uh, okay, good. good, good Let's good. remind them of the uh, webinar, webinar we've right? got. Riding the volatility wave uh, this Wednesday. Do we have a sign-up page? I don't have it pulled up. Okay. Know, yeah, we do have a Tristan's webinar coming up. It real quick. We got a webinar coming up here in the fourth. I'm going to let Alex take us through crypto. This is the longest show ever. Sorry, guys. Alex, do you want to take us through crypto and FX quickly? Or sure, no problem. Okay. Uh, we can we can show crypt cryptos. Okay. Maybe about five minutes, guys. Yeah. Uh, okay, Alex, you are live.
Yeah, okay, so uh, Bitcoin dollar chart, uh, rightfully so, we we have uh, kind of a predicted this um, a sideway consolidation, which has a gravity uh, to the uh, lower boundary of these trend lines. If you look the time elapsed in a wave one, uh, we are still didn't came even to 38% uh, of the time spent in the upside than this time spent in the sideway. So I think this sideway consolidation will will still be more uh, uh, ongoing thing uh, with a little bit pullback on the downside where we think that um, our finally uh, green wave two uh, will find its lows. And mostly on most of the cryptos, the situation is the same. We are on Ethereum as well in um, this type of a sideway price action. We are looking for some small triangle here with a uh, gravity to the downside as well but guys we are coming to the some longer term uh, targets when we are going to think to take uh, some uh, portfolio crypto trading for the next year or two so uh, <laughs> join us and and if you like to see how we do that uh, we have been actively trading cryptos for the last year our performance is is i must say very good and uh, I think we are the, the only service in the Elliott Wave spectrum that we do a live trading on cryptos as well. Absolutely. Yep. Well put. You've, you've been calling some amazing turning points when it seems that the crypto consensus is bullish, Alex is selling them. When the crypto consensus is bearish, Alex is buying them. Like he's, you seem to be one step ahead. Do you want to update us on FX? Uh, we better we better wrap this one up. Yeah, um, yeah we're yeah. not contrarians by nature. That's no. just what we're reading in no, the just, wave count. So just yeah, the masses our interpretations. Are usually, the masses are usually behind the curve, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you want a quick uh, FX or no, we're, we don't have time today. Here we got to get to the okay. members webinar. Okay. Uh, no but thank problem. you. Good work. Uh, so guys, the uh, the webinar that's coming up, and also if you enjoyed the video, please hit the thumbs up on YouTube and leave us a question or comment uh, for next week's show, guests to be determined. Uh, so the webinar next week, uh, we have a big webinar coming up for you, tradeanalysis.com forward slash ride, ride the volatility wave. Obviously there's a lot going on right now. Um, so I will drop the link in there for you. Uh, it's gonna be September 4th, uh, informational webinar, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Be sure to register to get a copy of the presentation. We're going to be talking about everything we discussed here, you know, how we structure our portfolios, uh, the context that we are given through the lens of Elliott, FIB intermarket analysis, how we use the news cycle that's, that's driving, uh, obviously, these markets, how to handle the summer market as we transition into a very busy uh, part of the last quarter of the year. So this is going to be a big webinar. So hit us up here, 8 p.m., September 4th. Can you guys drop the link in there into the chat window, uh, if you don't mind? One of my team members. And uh, we'll see you guys good. there. Um, I don't think we can drop, we can't drop the uh, oh, URL yeah, into the okay. chat window. Mm -hmm. No problem, I'll drop it. It doesn't let us. Oh, they won't let you. That's YouTube good. filters. Really? You don't watch page, okay. So here's the link, guys. It's um, www.tradinganalysis.com forward slash ride. Uh, okay, good. Guys, we're going to leave it there. Um, I, in the future, as we get better at this and you know, figure out what we're doing on this software, which is like prosumer crazy software. I've got like consultants working with me on this. Got to hire somebody to do it. We're going to have more shows. I mean, this is going to be the future. We're trying to fit too much in one show, so I'm sorry to take up so much of your time. Apologize about that. Uh, we're going to have to have multiple shows with guests, and you know, if, if we have you know specific breakout for Elliott Wave, like this is going to be the future. So we're just getting our getting our bearings here. It's kind of fun, but our first mission priority is trading these markets and and making our people money. That's the only thing we're really focused on. So check us out. Uh, we're at tradinganalysis.com. Uh, obviously, stocks, stock options, portfolios, forex, cryptos. We have it all. Motive Wave software, which is our Elliott Wave software. We are your uh, one-stop shop for discretionary analysis, real capital being deployed in real market situations. And I got a great team, as you can tell, and, and most of them are behind the scenes here. So 
they, uh, they, they put up with me. So thank you for putting up with me, team members and viewers. Guys, we'll see you, uh, right. see you next week. Thanks, Alex and Terry. See you guys next see week. See you guys. Bye-bye. See you next week.